Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the May meeting of our nonprofit plant based nutrition organization of Wisconsin, or PB Now. I'm your host, Terry Lynch. Uh, the mission of our nonprofit group is to educate, inspire, and support each other on an evidence backed whole plant food based nutritional path for a health and improved quality of life. Our group is open to everyone, those uh, plant based and those just curious about it. And it's meant to be a non judgmental place to come get information and uh, support, um, get information, inspiration, and support. If you like more information about our group, our upcoming meeting dates, speakers, and resources, or to check out uh, videos of our past meetings, just Google us at pbnow.org. That's pbnow.org. We're going to go kind of quickly tonight because our, our main speaker has another commitment right at uh, um, seven o'clock our time. So let me just uh, finish with these before the introduction. Um, we have meetings every month, usually on the second Thursday of the month, at six o'clock uh, central time. Next month, we're gonna hear from plant-based pioneer, Dr. Michael Clapper. We'll be posting more information about our upcoming meetings on the website at pbnow.org. Um, tonight, we're going to hear both from our uh, featured speaker who will, who will come first, and then following that will be Dr. Freeman, our PBNow medical director. Uh, who will finish with uh, some comments. A quick technical note during the meeting, everyone but the speaker will be muted. We ask you to stay that way to avoid background noise and allow everyone to uh, hear the speaker. All right, here we go. Our first speaker tonight is our featured speaker. He's a summa cum laude graduate of Cornell University and a research honors graduate of SUNY at Buffalo School of Medicine and Biomedical Science. He did his residency at Brown University, uh, Rhode Island Hospital in internal medicine and a fellowship at uh, Temple University in cardiology. He's director of cardiovascular prevention and wellness at Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado. Um, he's also uh, been nicknamed the vegan cardiologist. I'm excited to welcome back with his excellent annual roundup of the past years uh, notable nutritional research, our featured speaker tonight, Dr. Andrew Freeman. Dr. Freeman? Well, thanks so much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right. And Terry, thanks as always for organizing. What a great group and nice to be back. So every year, as you know, for those of you that have seen me talk, I put together uh, what I think are some of the most important things in the plant-based world. Uh, so I'm going to jump right in. Uh, and I just want to point out that there are Lots of well-done randomized trials showing the efficacy of plant-based diets. Some are observational, don't show a direct cause, but show significant relationships. And before I go any further, I show this slide every year. You can be plant-based and get plenty of protein. Really, protein deficiency very seldom exists outside of calorie deficiency, uh, which as you know, in the United States is pretty rare in general. We've got a lot to co cover tonight, so I encourage you to get your coffee. And every year, I'm always excited to learn that coffee seems to be more and more beneficial. And this large study of almost half a million participants followed for 11 years, up to three cups of coffee a day, uh, actually had 12% less death overall, less cardiovascular mortality, and 21% less stroke. Um, and so in general, it also even had improvement in the way the heart functions, which is pretty powerful. So as we get moving, uh, the stats every year are always pretty scary. So here's the global burden of cardiovascular disease. And it's interesting to see that if you, and this are in disability adjusted life years, which is a way of reporting it, blue is actually a little bit less. And then you can see uh, that in parts of uh, Europe and Russia and Eastern Europe and Africa, uh, the burden is really high. And it's interesting, if you look at the cardiovascular diseases as a whole, you know, most of it is ischemic heart disease, which is the red bar in there. And as you see, Central Asia, Oceania, which is, uh, Australia, et cetera. Um, and I think someone might need to mute uh, whoever's not muted there. Um, but you can see that a lot of it is ischemic heart disease, which makes it uh, a major problem. And ischemic heart disease, of course, is coronary heart disease. And then you may have seen that even environmental risks are now noted, which is pretty amazing. So things like particulate 
matter pollution and solid fuel pollution and lead exposure and uh, temperature and all these other things. So it's pretty amazing. And when you look, dietary risks on the far right chart there uh, are a major uh, cause of cardiovascular disease uh, issue. Um, is there a Debbie on the line? If she could just mute the, let me see if I can mute her. I muted her. All right, there we go. Um, there we go. And uh, moving on, uh, you can see here the behavioral risks. Dietary risks are, are the, by far the most important of all. And then there's smoking. Um, and uh, then there's secondhand smoke. And, yeah, and then you'll see little bits of uh, high alcohol use. So uh, I'm going to, I keep trying I'm gonna to try, I'm going to try this again. I think Debbie is on a, it's on a cell phone and, and I keep muting it and it keeps bouncing back. Yeah, I think she's unmuting it. Uh, I do too, actually. <laughs> All right. So moving on, um, the dietary risk is the big one. And then if you look, um, one of the things that most of us cardiologists don't like to really spend a lot of time with, maybe except for me, is blood pressure. And blood pressure is a huge proportion of cardiovascular disease. In the United States, as you may recall from last year's talk, it's around 50%. Um, and dietary risks, of course, are up there too. So you can see that when you look at the literature, as much as it kind of puts everything together, it's very clear that our lifestyle is killing us. And if you look in the uh, JAMA, this is trends in diet quality among older adults, um, you'll see here that based on the score, um, the proportion of US older adults with a poor diet quality increased significantly over the last couple of years. So we need to do better. Only one in five Americans have cardiovascular health that's considered optimal based on AHA's Life Essential 8 checklist. Uh, and they examine factors like physical activity, diet, smoking, sleep, body mass index, blood pressure, lipids, and glucose. Maybe we need a different report card, you might ask. Well, believe it or not, another one was done. This was also, this was published in uh, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Only 7%, less than 7% of US adults had optimal cardiometabolic uh, health, which is declining. And the largest declines were for uh, adiposity, meaning fat stores were getting fatter and in glucose control worsened as well. And then maybe uh, you saw the Centers for Disease Control, and it's interesting, we used to think of the CDC around COVID and infection, but it turns out that non-communicable diseases remain the most important cause for uh, cardiovascular disease. And uh, in 2019, uh, only 12% and 10% of adults met fruit and vegetable intake recommendations. Uh, and it was actually a uh, highest, uh, interestingly, among Hispanic adults and lowest among males. So interestingly, meeting ve vegetable intake recommendations uh, was highest in, in adults over 51 uh, and lowest among adults with low income. And that's where that socioeconomic divide comes in. And if you look, this was in the 2022 ACC expert consensus decision pathway for integrating atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and multimorbidity treatment. But I'm very proud because I pushed hard to get this statement in there which is a robust data set with good quality evidence suggests a lower fat whole food plant forward diet can reduce and even prevent morbidity in ASCVD. So again, every major pro uh, uh, professional society now endorses this approach. And uh, this was a really interesting one. Um, so sickness now also is uh, making our financial health sick. Uh, health affairs surveys show that 1.2 million Americans hit catastrophic spending in the healthcare sector, about 14% of Americans spending more than 40% of their family income on things like insulin. All right, well, if you're waiting for a sign to go vegan, this is it. So how about this was a really interesting study that my good colleague, Kim Williams was involved in. So they looked at 104 TV commercials 89 chosen randomly during TV watch and 14 targeted to enrich the sample with leading quick service restaurants. The commercials fell in the four categories, fast food, brand recognized individual items, grocery chains, and home delivery meals. And it turns out that almost all of the commercials were for fast food. And if you were to look at the distribution of health diet index in the commercials, almost none of them are healthy. There are very, very few of them. How about uh, the constant debate between vegan or Mediterranean? And let me uh, assure you all that a truly Mediterranean diet done in a Mediterranean, not American Mediterranean way is a mostly plant-based diet anyway. But that said, in this study, 62 overweight participants were enrolled in either a low-fat plant-based diet or a Mediterranean diet with a four-week washout, meaning they, were doing, uh, they weren't on it for those four weeks. And the vegan diet continues to show more weight loss. And this has been shown a few times already. And if you're going to do Mediterranean, how about doing a green Mediterranean diet, which is a plant, fully plant-based Mediterranean diet? 
And uh, in this study of about 300 participants, they chose doing healthy dietary guidelines, uh, which are, in my opinion, in quotes, Mediterranean diet or a green Mediterranean diet. Uh, and they combine it with physical activity in both the Mediterranean diets, similar calories, uh, and actually included things like walnuts. And it turns out um, that the green med diet also consumed green tea and a plant green shake. And after 18 months uh, following them, they actually had a ghrelin increase uh, by 1.3%. Um, and in the uh, Mediterranean, uh, in the green med uh, diet, and when that happens, this means that insulin is more sensitive and helps with getting rid of visceral fat, meaning getting rid of belly fat. So pretty amazing. How about blood pressure? So 140 participants with quote, treatment resistant hypertension, they compared blood pressure and cardiovascular disease biomarkers. 50% got a lifestyle modification. The control group attended just a single counseling session. And those in the lifestyle group lowered their systolic blood pressure by about 12 and a half points. And the 24 hour mean drop was around seven. And what I wanna point out is that may not seem like a lot to you, but it's actually rivals what many of the blood pressure pills have done over the years in large populations. And the results are comparable to the other blood pressure pills as I just mentioned. So how about this? We actually, uh, my group, uh, Dr. DeVries and others, we surveyed 123 cardiologists. And it turns out that almost all of us, 71%, referred only 10% of fewer patients. That means that the majority of cardiologists surveyed don't refer patients often to dietitians. And most of those surveyed thought that the patient's lack of motivation or interest in nutrition was the largest challenge to lifestyle change. There was a positive though, 59% of cardiologists believe that nutrition interventions improve health outcomes as much if not more so than pharmaceuticals. So we're moving the needle, it's just taken some time and we really gotta get people to work as a team. And this was an interesting one. Uh, it said that a sustained change from a typical Western diet to the optimal diet from age 20 onward, meaning starting early in life would increase life expectancy by more than a decade for women in the United States uh, and, uh, and men as well. And an optimal diet had substantially more plants in it. So a really interesting way to show that life expectancy can change. Now we often hear about, uh, you know, one of my patients will say to me, well, doc, if I eat the way I want you to eat, uh, I'm just gonna want my life to end anyway. So why would I do it? But this was interesting, 8,000 students um, did a well-being survey and higher intakes of fruits and vegetables actually improved well-being scores more than those who ate the least, which was zero. And the same thing happened when uh, people ate breakfast and uh, didn't consume energy drinks, interestingly enough. So you may have seen there's a whole lot of stuff that has recently come out on artificial sweeteners and they turn, to be, turn out to be just as bad as the regular sugar sweetened things as well. In this particular study of 74 people, uh, they looked at regular sugar and sucralose or water and the brain MRI showed increased activity in craving brain areas in women in particular and in people who were obese. So women and people with obesity experienced an increase in appetite and food cravings after drinking a sucralose containing beverage, interestingly enough. So again, the perfect beverage for human consumption remains water. The New York Times reported that we are in an epidemic of diet related illnesses and the FDA released novel guidance aimed at reducing the amount of salts Americans consume. They're seeking to reduce the average daily sodium intake by 12% over the next two and a half years by encouraging food manufacturers to scale back. We'll have to see how successful that is. And then another study, uh, this one from China with high blood pressure, uh, they randomized to a control diet or cuisine based on Chinese heart healthy diet. And it turns out that the blood pressure drops for about 10 points, which again is very impressive. And the authors conclude that this approach is effective and cost effective. So you've probably heard me talk over the years about the, the link between dairy and milk and cancer. In this 26,000 participant study from Japan, those who consume the most milk and yogurt had a nearly 40% higher risk for developing prostate cancer, believe it or not. So again, stay away from milk if you can. I love showing this graphic. I think it's from the 1950s, right? It says butter is slippery. That's why we eat as much as possible to lubricate our arteries and veins, said nobody ever uh, these days. So 1,900 patients uh, with stable angina pectoris from Western Norway, Norway uh, in a B vitamin intervention trial, those who had more dairy actually had more strokes and more cardiovascular disease. And if they ate more butter, they had 10% more heart attacks. So again, I can't stress it enough, butter is not your friend. And more than half a million participants in China, in China who were followed for 11 years, every 50 grams or a quarter cup of milk per day 
increased cancer overall by 7%, liver cancer by 12%, and female breast cancer by nearly 20%. And a synthesis of 32 different publications uh, showed that in general, uh, favorable results of lifestyle modifications with a plant-based diet help to improve prostate cancer outcomes. And observational studies demonstrate either a uh, it demonstrated a lower risk of prostate cancer. Uh, the Adventist Health Study, as you may know, the Seventh-day Adventists follow a plant-based diet in, uh, as part of their religion. Uh, they looked at data from about 29,000 men, and men at the 90th percentile of dairy intake had 27% more prostate cancer compared to just 10%, and when compared to, uh, when compared to zero intake, 62% higher prostate cancer risk. So in general, pretty scary data from dairy. Uh, how about alcohol? You may have seen this, but in general, we used to recommend a little bit of alcohol to reduce cardiovascular risk, which may still be the case, but in general, it is associated with breast cancer. Um, and it's interesting, they say here to greater than 10% of the alcohol attributable cancer cases in Europe arise from drinking just one bottle of beer or two small glasses of wine per day. And it's even higher for breast cancer. <clears throat> this came out of the American Heart Association, uh, the 2021 Dietary Guidance to Improve Cardiovascular Health. And they basically say that uh, choose a, uh, uh, eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, choose a wide variety, choose a healthy source of protein, mostly protein from plants. So again, these are in the guidelines. That's pretty amazing. And so now when you eat this way, you, you can say that you are following the latest evidence. 328 participants that were over 60, uh, turns out that a vegan diet helps to reduce the number of pills by almost two thirds even after adjusting for a number of confounders. So eat plants and have less pills. Saw this neat sign the other day. If your doctor prescribes you a medication without asking about your diet, sleep, exercise, water, structural issues, et cetera, you don't have a doctor, you have a drug dealer. Uh, interesting and bold statement, that's for sure. So in uh, this one, this was a, an interesting one. 459 adults uh, without cardiovascular disease were put on a um, DASH diet or a fruit and vegetable diet intervention. And DASH is the, one of the original more plant-based diets that the dietary approaches to stopping hypertension. And uh, both of them reduced cardiovascular risk by about 10% uh, each, which is pretty amazing. And in just eight weeks. So what I wanna point out, and people ask me this, doc, what am I gonna start to notice an improvement? Well, you may not directly notice an improvement, although many times you will, but your risk drops markedly very quickly. Uh, this was a 27-year follow-up study from the Nurses Health Study Health Professionals follow-up study, and those who had the highest quintile of non-dairy animal fat intake were 16% more likely to have a stroke, and if you ate more vegetable fat and polyunsaturated fat, you had 12% less stroke. How about this? You may have heard me talk about transmethylamine oxide, or TMAO, which is uh, made from the uh, flora in your gut when you eat meat or, or carnitine containing compounds, it converts it to TMAO, which is highly associated with all sorts of cardiovascular diseases. Uh, but in this particular study, in about 4,000 participants after adjustment, higher un intakes of unprocessed red meat, total meat, um, markedly increased uh, the um, uh, TMAO levels, which had a much higher ASCVD risk, 15% more, 22% more, and 18% more. Uh, so that's an unprocessed red meat, total meat, and uh, total uh, 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 animal-based uh, foods. Um, and the understand, this is Kim Williams' quote on this, the understanding of most clinicians and nutritionists does not include this important fact, red meat kills and processed meat kills faster. Pretty bold statement. All right, back to coffee. This was interesting in about 2,600 pregnant people low and moderated caffeinated beverage intake uh, in the second trimester uh, seemed to be safe. In fact, it actually lowered the rates of gestational diabetes um, and there was no association between it and hypertension or preeclampsia. Uh, this was in about 400,000 individuals without cardiovascular disease, up to three cups of coffee a day was associated with the greatest benefit translating into about a 15% lower risk of heart disease, heart failure, or arrhythmia, believe it or not, or dying for any reason. So if you like your coffee, drink it. Just remember the quickest way to transform a two calorie per cup healthful beverage into a 2000 calorie per cup heart attack is to get your mixed, uh, your, your, uh, sorry, your mocha whipped yada yada 
a sugar sweetened beverage at your local coffee shop, don't do that if you can avoid it. This is another interesting study of 35,000 individuals consuming any amount of coffee was not associated with a higher risk of arrhythmias, including AFib. And of the 24,000 people included in the analysis who had an arrhythmia at baseline, uh, drinking coffee had a lower risk of death and people with AFib who drank one cup of coffee were nearly 20% less likely to die than non-coffee drinkers. And then in another study of 172,000 participants from the UK, consumers of various amounts of unsweetened coffee had lower risk for all-cause mortality. And the sweet spot was somewhere in the range of about three-ish cups per day with almost 30% less mortality. And even with sugar in this study, uh, there was a max of 28% less mortality, interestingly enough. So watch the sweeteners. This was another one, 103,000 adults from the, um, the Nutranet study uh, in France, uh, higher consumers of artificial sweeteners, higher risk of cancer, up to 13% more cancer, aspartame commonly known as sweet and low, 15% uh, more cancer, acesulfan K, 13% more. And a lot of these are added to a lot of your products that, uh, that everyone likes to eat and drink. How about with arthritis, 124 cases, uh, it's 65% lower odds of having knee arthritis than those who ate the most plant-based even after adjustment for confounders, including body mass index. 44% uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis, a vegan diet uh, versus placebo, uh, it showed that their disease activity markedly dropped in the rheumatoid arthritis group on the plant-based diet. How about sleep? This was interesting. So going to sleep between 10 and 11 is associated with the lowest risk of developing heart disease uh, compared to earlier or later. 88,000 individuals in the UK biobank recruited between 2006 and 2010 followed for six years. 5% higher risk of cardiovascular disease if you went to bed after midnight. 12% greater risk for 11 to 11.59, and a 24% risk for falling asleep before 10, interestingly enough. So try to go to bed every night at 10 o'clock and get seven or eight hours of sleep if you can. Um, this was an interesting one. So this was a, uh, a 239 uh, patients were enrolled in a cardiovascular prevention uh, versus a standard general clinic. The prevention group had regular counseling on lifestyle, and at six months, they had lost uh, about uh, two kilograms, which is about five pounds versus a gain in the general normal group. And they had about a 25 point drop in their cholesterol, interestingly enough. Um, whoops, this is not showing so well. So this was 22,000 participants from the Malmo diet and cancer cohort. Those with the highest adherence to the Lancet diet, which is mostly a plant-based diet, much less cancer mortality, heart disease mortality, and overall mortality. And this study of 45 overweight or, uh, overweight or obese patients um, with a high cholesterol, they put them on three cholesterol lowering diets. One, it was a lower fat diet, two moderate fat diets with avocados and a moderate fat diet that used high oleic acid oils to match the fatty content of one avocado. And it turns out that the uh, avocado diet had about a 14 uh, point drop uh, and also dropped particle number and small dense LDL. Uh, whereas the uh, moderate fat diet did have a drop and the low fat diet had a drop, but the greatest gain seemed to be surprisingly with avocados. Uh, this is the nurse's health study, again, followed for 28 years. And if you have a diet that includes half a tablespoon of olive oil daily, cardiovascular disease seemed to be lower by 19%. And if you can replace 10 grams a day of margarine, butter, mayonnaise, and dairy fat, with the equivalent amount of olive oil, you had up to a 34% 34% lower risk of mortality, interestingly. So this was a really great uh, commentary. So this was on the benefits of a plant-based diet for COVID-19. Well, uh, one study showed a healthy plant-based diet was associated with a 9% lower risk of infection, 41% lower risk of severe COVID, one that might say land you in the hospital. Another found that healthcare workers following a plant-based diet who had substantial exposure to COVID-19 had nearly three quarters lower risk of moderate severe COVID. And another looked at Okinawa, Japan, which had seen low COVID mortality rates attributable to their plant-based diets. Remember, that's one of the blue zones. And it really does look like that picture in the bottom. So for those of you that have seen me talk before, we talked a lot about eggs in the past and this study of about 27,000 men for each additional 300 milligram cholesterol intake, there was 10% higher mortality and more cardiovascular disease mortality. 
And for each additional 50 gram egg consumed daily, 6% higher overall mortality and 9% uh, higher cardiovascular disease mortality. How about on diabetes? This was interesting from the Nurses Health Study again. Uh, they did a metabolite profile score of a plant-based diet index. So they saw just how well people were adhering to a plant-based diet. And those uh, who had a healthy plant-based diet uh, actually had much less overall risk of diabetes. Uh, so an inverse association with type 2 diabetes and the healthier your diet, the less diabetes. How about this one? This was called the three city cohort. Uh, so they were looking at uh, places in Bordeaux, Dijon, France, uh, and they did a couple of tests to measure mental uh, performance. And there was a, a protective association uh, when there were metabolites found from coffee, cocoa, mushrooms, red wine, and uh, polyphenol rich foods, and therefore less cognitive decline. And when they found artificial sweeteners and alcohol in the bloodstream, they had a hurtful association with mental status. So eat well if you can. This is another interesting one, um, an, an analysis of about 6,000 participants from uh, the Tsuchi vegetarian study. Vegetarians were associated uh, with reduced risk of clinically overt dementia, so about a third less compared to the non-vegetarians. This was the circulatory risk in community study, about 3,800 Japanese individuals followed for 20 years. 26% less dementia for those who consume the most fiber. Another study uh, of about 5,000 participants from the original Framingham Heart Study, high blood sugar levels measured in middle age had about a 15% increased risk of dementia decades later. Uh, this was interesting, 575 deceased patients from the Rush Memory and Aging Project, and they looked uh, to see if they could find this Pelar gonidin which uh, is modeled in quartiles and uh, from berry intake as continuous servings per week. And it turns out that this compound, uh, specifically strawberries as well, reduce the amyloid beta load and the tau tangles, which is what's associated with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this was an interesting one in uh, children, about 9,000 children from six months to eight years old, uh, they showed here that evidence of clinically meaningful differences in growth or biochemical measures of nutrition for children with vegetarian diet was not found, meaning you can have a vegetarian child who does just fine in life. And in this interesting study, this was 11 trials with 800 participants. And when you look at a control diet versus a vegan diet, reduced body weight, reduced body mass index, reduced A1C, which is a measure of diabetes, reduced cholesterol and reduced LDL or the bad cholesterol. So again, every study that seems to come out shows the same thing, which is a plant-based diet seems to improve a number of risk factors or actual cardiovascular risk. This was a really interesting one about fish. So I get asked about fish all the time. Well, doc, can I still have some fish? Well, besides the PCBs, dioxins, heavy metals, organophosphates, microplastics, nuclear fallout, this was an interesting one about skin cancer. And it turns out that if you look at highest to lowest total fish intake, tuna intake, and non-fried fish intake, those who consume the most had 22% higher melanoma and 28% higher melanoma in situ, which is when the cancer is still confined to its borders. It's very interesting. Uh, this was a really interesting one. So this was dietary interventions to treat uh, type two diabetes in adults. And what they showed was that diet as a primary intervention is most effective in, and also is useful in achieving remission uh, in diabetes, which is amazing in itself. A low-fat, whole-food, plant-based diet can sustain remission. Uh, a very low-carb diet can actually cause adverse events and make this inadvisable. And lifestyle change interventions should be prioritized and reimbursed, says these authors. Another study in Athens, Greece, 1,500 people followed for 10 years, four servings a day of fruits and vegetables, nearly two-thirds lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes, and 71% in women in particular. Another study of preeclampsia, which is a big problem that some people face when they are in the later stages of pregnancy. Uh, it turns out that greatest adherence with a Mediterranean diet lowers the risk of preeclampsia by about a quarter, and for black women, even more. Now, you probably know that uh, in the United States, we share one of the worst distinctions and that we have some of the highest rates of colon cancer in people under 40. In this large study of 53,000 participants, a 33% increase for late onset colorectal cancer for every 100 grams of unprocessed red meat intake per day. That's just 3.5 ounces 
which is actually smaller than most people's stake survey. In men from the health professionals follow-up study, um, it showed that the, uh, those in the highest fifth of consumption uh, of uh, fried and ultra-processed foods, 29% higher risk of colorectal cancer, which remained significant even after adjusting for their size and the nutritional quality of their diet otherwise. I always tell people it's time to make some changes. We used to tell people, not me, but generations before me, that smoking was good for you. And now we tell uh, many of our patients that they should eat meat because they're anemic or whatever else. And a lot of that is just untrue. So you may have seen this, uh, but this was interesting. Uh, this came out of uh, the British Medical Journal. Widespread adoption of plant-based diets is required uh, to stem the growth of greenhouse gases by 2050. Turns out that dietary choices account for over a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions and meat consumption in America and Europe would need to drop by almost 80% and almost 70% to reach these goals. And the authors call for removing subsidies on livestock uh, while increasing access to plant-based foods. Um, this was interesting. This was in uh, the Times in the UK, uh, and they came up with that humans are wiping out 70% of animals in the last 50 years, uh, which is pretty scary. And we've done a lot of that in our fruit and vegetable variety, as you may know, like we have certain types of wheat or carrots or whatever, and we seem to be doing it similarly. Uh, this was a really interesting one. If you haven't seen it in the New York Times, uh, this was see the true cost of your cheap chicken. And they literally take you in to a chicken farm and see how your chicken is prepared. It is mind blowing. And you can find this at the New York Times website. Uh, and this is the second in the series of three videos exploring the harms of the global food system and the urgent need to address them. New York Times, I'm gonna bet that almost none of you <clears throat> have friends or colleagues outside of the plant-based world who have even mentioned this. And yet it's in one of the most prestigious newspapers we have. Um, and then this is really interesting. So the Chinese are now sending boats to catch fish off of the Galapagos Islands. And it turns out that as one of the world's most populous countries with an economy that has grown, China has a growing global footprint and it needs so much fish to feed a middle class that it be, they have to send out boats to parts of the world that they don't have normally have access to because they don't have enough fish for their people. Um, this was an interesting one. So uh, this was a study looking at people who currently pass out, which is uh, not all that uncommon, believe it or not. And they randomized people to uh, a specialized yoga training program uh, or just control uh, current guideline uh, driven therapy. And it turns out that there were four times less uh, events where people passed out in this group, um, which was pretty amazing. So it turns out that mind over matter and a mindfulness approach really can help to fight uh, some serious disease. Uh, this was interesting, 50,000 adults from the biobank, uh, those who had significant exercise reduced cardiovascular events but the effect was greater for those with anxiety or depression. And if you've heard me speak before, I've shown some data that shows that exercise is one of the most potent ways to reduce anxiety or depression. And interestingly, uh, this was again in the New York Times, speeding up your daily walk could have big benefits, they say. And in the largest study to incorporate activity tracker data, picking up the pace brings dividends to long-term health. Uh, and it looks at a, uh, data from about 80,000 people walking at a brisk pace for 30 minutes, and it reduces heart disease, cancer, dementia, and death, um, interestingly enough. And about 10,000 steps a day offer the highest level of protection. Uh, another study here uh, showed that uh, following these folks, about 80,000 for seven years, 8% less death, 10% less cardiovascular deaths, and 11% less cancer death. Now you might think this is weird, but believe it or not, this showed up in the, uh, one of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology about spirituality in patients with heart failure. And, and what it showed uh, that uh, the literature suggests that not only can spirituality improve quality of life for the patient, but it, it can help support caregivers and heart failure patients from needing to be readmitted to the hospital. So pretty powerful. And how about this one? This was pretty amazing. 28 article analysis, any mindful practice dropped A1C, measure of diabetes, by nearly a point. And yoga was very good at it at 1%, which is as powerful as some of the meds we use for diabetes right now. 
Uh, you may have seen some good news this year. This was a bill that promoted nutritious plant-based school uh, meals in California. Um, and then you may have seen this. This was interesting in The Economist about American hospital food is fast improving and doctors are taking nutrition seriously. And Intermountain, which is part of the group that I'm affiliated with, um, has uh, since uh, served freshly made meals to patients. Uh, they sourced local ingredients and they are consulted to meet patients' dietary needs, interestingly enough. Uh, as you may have seen, Mayor Adams and the American College of Lifestyle Medicine uh, from New York City uh, announced a $44 million deal to offer lifestyle medicine foundational training to every New York City healthcare practitioner. You may have seen this, that medically tailored meals could save the US nearly $14 billion per year. So imagine that if instead of prescribing pills, we prescribed food and actually gave it to the patients uh, at a farm instead of a pharmacy. Uh, this was really interesting. This was a moral imperative that came out in the American uh, Journal of uh, Cardiology. And it said that a societal shift towards more whole food, plant-based eating stands to provide significant health benefits and ethical advantages. And the medical profession has a duty to advocate accordingly. And although it remains important for individuals to make better food choices, personal responsibility is predicated on sound advice and resource equity, including having these options available. Nutrition equity is a moral imperative and should be a top priority in the promotion of public health. And I wanna point out, this is one of the top tier cardiovascular journals. Uh, I love showing this slide. This is an incredibly common thing. And you may have some friends or family on Ozempic or Wegovi or one of these things, you know, where they have to be committed for a lifetime uh, on these medicines to maintain their weight loss. Whereas lifestyle changes, you can see the guy there is just waiting to talk. He's reading a book because nobody wants to talk to him. I always point out that lifestyle is incredibly powerful. Uh, and this is our uh, outcomes from our intensive cardiac rehab program at St. Joe's where I oversee it. And you can see that people lose weight and their cholesterol drops and their triglycerides drop and their blood pressure drops and their A1C drops and they become less depressed and exercise more. And this is based on the work of Ornish. And this is the Ornish intensive cardiac rehab program where people come in when they're sick after a cardiovascular event and they get so much better. Uh, you can see nationally, the outcomes are just as strong. So overall, what is success? It is a low fat, 100% whole grain, uh, minimally processed whole food plant-based diet. Albert Einstein always reminds us that nothing will benefit our chances for survival for life on earth as much as the evolution to a vegetarian diet. I encourage you to also check out Walk With a Doc, which may exist in your area, uh, but if not, uh, consider asking your doctors to get it started. But I would love uh, for uh, people to, to start uh, getting these programs up and running everywhere. It's a great way to uh, inspire patients to move more. We also have a really lovely plant-based support group as you're transitioning. If you're interested, you can actually join on Zoom right from your neck of the woods. Uh, it's run by a really a fantastic nutrition person. And you can also find this on the National Jewish website where I work, and it's free. For those of you that are healthcare providers, uh, believe it or not, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is offering nearly six hours of CME uh, and showing uh, and giving the food as medicine essentials course bundle. And you can find it here. And if you put in this promo code ESS-NJH, -ES you'll get it for free. And if you're not convinced, um, read up on this, get excited about it, learn and get inspired because the results are truly extraordinary. And with that, Terry, I left a little bit of time for questions. That is great. Holy mackerel, did you pack a lot of excellent information there? And it's uh, just so exciting and so confirming. And uh, I was writing with my uh, pen and typing in as, as quickly as I could for some of this. And I'll remind everybody, we are going to post this. Uh, it'll probably be within the next week if you want to go back over some of this. And I, Notice a lot of people came on here late. So if you want to catch the beginning of it and then go back over some things you've seen before, uh, that's great. So if, uh, people would like to either put questions in the chat or put uh, put your your hand up the uh, down in the uh, reactions area. You can uh, put a hand up 
I do have a question that came in, and this is kind of a specific question for somebody, Dr. Freeman. Uh, they were saying they're they're saying I take uh, twenty milli milligrams of atorvast atorvastatin. Atorvastatin, uh huh. Okay. Uh, their LDL is 50, total cholesterol 116. And they're asking, is it possible to, quote, wean off, unquote, a statin if one's LDL remains below 70? She says, I had a stent place in 2020, and since then I'm on a plant-based diet. Yeah, so this is a question we get all the time, and it's quite controversial in the plant-based world. So let me tell you, that sadly, in people who have had cardiovascular events, heart attack, stroke, bypass, stents, uh, in general, these folks really do need to be on statins. Now, you might say to me, well, what about a lifestyle approach? What about a plant-based diet? Won't that lower my risk? So it turns out that statins do significantly lower cardiovascular risk, and they also... Um, uh, also, a low-fat, uh, whole food, low-fat, plant-based diet also lowers cardiovascular risk, and they've never been randomized against each other. So most likely, they, you know, the statin lowers risk and the diet lowers risk, and together, they're likely synergistic. And I always tell people that we don't have enough data to recommend weaning somebody off of what appears to be a life-saving medication. So my suggestion would be to keep doing both, and uh, let's see what happens. Now, you can make an informed decision where you say, you know what? the overall risk reduction is relatively small and I'm going to take my chances on a really good lifestyle and you may be just fine. I just can't tell you that's the case because we don't have enough evidence to tell you the truth. Thank you. A Andrew, if, if, uh, if I could add in, this is uh, Josh Liberman. So I'm also, you know, preventive cardiologist like you, uh, just answering that question. You know, the, the just simple math, if you stop your tour and your LDL is likely to go up, you know, to, to say 80 or 90, um, just based on the, the, the known percentage decrease that we get with that medicine at that dose. And 80 or 90 is probably not at goal any longer for somebody who has had to have a stent uh, placed. And so if you got your LDL down even further, you could make an argument maybe. Um, but I agree with Andrew in that, or Dr. Freeman in that, you know, it's, it, in this situation, it might be, it might be safest to use all the tools available to you in, instead of relying on just one tool. Yeah, and for what it's worth, actually, the European guidelines want LDL to be below 55 in people with pet stents, uh, and the exact mark place where you know coronary disease progression is less likely is unclear, <clears throat> but it seems that lower is better. Yep. Thanks, Dr. Liberman, uh, for adding to that. Um, one of the questions is, where is this video posted? And uh, as we mentioned when we started, this will be on, you can go to YouTube, and you can just uh, type in PBNOW, uh, and then you go to our area and then hit uh, videos on there. It'll uh, pull up all the videos. It probably won't be up until about this time next week, but it will be up, and then you, then you can go to it and uh, check it out and check all the other videos up there, too. Uh, Nancy asked, what about using stevia as a sweetener? And I I'm not yeah, sure. and, and Terry, I see the question, so I'm going to try to zip through them so I can okay. get everybody's. Um, so it turns out that artificial sweeteners are probably not helpful. If you said to me, well, I need to have something, right now it appears that stevia and just stevia, there are some that products that mix stevia with erythritol, which I would recommend avoiding until we get more data about them, but stevia might be the safest of the lots, but even better would be to eat a fruit or, or some sweet vegetable if you prefer the sweetness there. Um, it says here, what's the name of the group with the PB Zoom group you belong to? I'm not sure what that question is, Terry. Yeah, I don't. Are you asking about our group, or are you asking about Andrew's? Um, and Andrew, if you can mention that one again that you mentioned was a free, um, I think yeah. kind of. So if you go to the National Jewish website, you'll see the transitioning to plant-based diet support group, uh, and that meets typically the third Saturday of the month on Zoom. Um, so check it out. So National Jewish Health is where I work. It's not specifically religious in any way. Technically, we are a secular institution at this point, uh, despite the name. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we got the code for the sweetener, uh, sorry, for the uh, ACLM course. <clears throat> and I, I think, are those all the questions? I think I may have gotten it. Does anyone else have any burning questions? Uh, I'll just ask, uh, you know, Paleo, what, what are your uh, feelings about that and, and why? 
Yeah, so you, you, those of you um, who are uh, watching the media regularly, you may have seen that the American College of Cardiology meeting had a late-breaking clinical trial on a low-carb diet, which actually showed harm. And Michael Greger puts it best, it might mean that some people lose weight, but it might mean just skinnier coffins, meaning that the risk of death is high. Uh, and so what I always tell people is, when you eliminate garbage foods or car, you know what I call garbage, garbage carbs, you're going to lose weight. But do you need to get rid of all of the good carbs like lentils and legumes and you know brown rice or even a potato? And the answer is no. Um, but if you're trying to accelerate weight loss, going lower carb might be to your benefit. And what I mean by that is. If you go to a lot of the plant-based restaurants, even the healthier ones, they can sometimes give you a gigantic rice bowl with a lot of vegetables on top, but you're getting like a pound of rice in there, which has a lot of calories. So you might want to go with a little bit of rice or even no rice some meals and see how you do. Great. Uh, does anybody else have a question? All right, well, uh, we'll let you get to your meeting uh, that much quicker. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. You, uh, as I said, you really packed a lot here in a short period of time, and people who want to, who want to check this out again will be able to go to the video. Thank yeah, you. my pleasure. It was great to, ha great to ha be here, and uh, I'm sorry it was so dense, but I, I want people to really get excited about all of this. So. And uh, we hope to see you next year with the next one. You bet. Take care. Thanks, Andrew. Bye now. Thanks. And our next speaker is our, our, our own PBNOW medical director. He's a fellowship trained cardiologist, CEO and owner of Wisconsin Cardiology Associates, past president and current trustee of the Wisconsin chapter of the American College of Cardiology, uh, a member of the American Car College of Cardiology's National Nutrition and Lifestyle Work Group, whose membership, who, which was actually started by Dr. Freeman and whose membership uh, includes nationally known physicians such as Dr. Dean Ornish, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, and Dr. Neil Bernard. He's an advocate for the use of plant-based nutrition to help improve heart health, general health, and quality of life, and has seen the benefits of plant-based nutrition in both his personal life and that of his patients. We're fortunate to have him here in Milwaukee and as our PBNL medical director. I'm happy to welcome Dr. Joshua Liberman. Dr. Liberman? Yep. Thanks so much, Terry. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Wonderful. So thanks everybody for being here. Uh, it's hard to follow that. Uh, I usually like leading off these things because it's uh, it's not so intimidating to, to, to you know, talk after a, such a, uh, a virtuoso performance. And uh, boy, there was a dynamo. There's so much data there. And of course, I usually like to talk about some of the data, you know, as a little, just a, uh, you know, uh, an appetizer, so to speak to the usual talk. So it's hard for me to give more data on top of everything that he just presented. And uh, like a lot of people maybe on this call, I'm gonna, we're gonna take some time to go over it, uh, the recorded version once it's posted to YouTube and maybe put it on like 0.5 speed to like just slowly be able to digest or at least I'll be able to hit the pause button pretty frequently and, and, and write things down. So that's, the, that's, that's wonderful and uh, appreciate Andrew coming on so much. Um, I don't, I mean, uh, I don't have a lot to say after something like that, but I guess I did want to highlight, it's just coincidentally, I was going to highlight uh, something that was more recent that I wasn't sure he was going to get uh, to touch on, which was that late breaking clinical trial uh, at the American College of Cardiology annual meeting that was just about a, a month and a half ago, maybe two months ago. And I figured it might be safe to talk about that. And I was going to talk about it in a little bit of a different way. Um, and, and maybe it actually pertains to that question, that very specific question about the patient with the stent and, the, and on, the, on the cholesterol medication. Um, because, so I know that, you know, Andrew focused a lot on the benefits of a vegan or, you know, whole food plant-based diet. Um, but what I think might be useful is to spend just a few minutes talking about, yeah, the potential harm for a, a, a very low carb, paleo, keto, Atkins kind of diet. Um, so what this study looked at was actually data from the UK Biobank study, which is what I've referred to many times in the past, actually, in these talks, because there's, it's, just, it's just such a, 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 a beautiful repository of extensive information on a whole lot of patients. And as a result, we can really mine that database for a lot of really useful, important, uh, important data. Now, 
it is important to note it's not a randomized control trial, which is, you know, which is supposed to be, you know, which is thought of as, as the gold standard. And observational studies are number one, um, uh, sometimes the best we can do. You know, I mean, it, it, that's just looking at around us, at our communities, at our cultures, at, at the populations on the planet and seeing who has healthier populations and who doesn't and trying to mimic those, right? So there's not, that's observational and, and there would be nothing wrong with that. Um, but as I said, it is an observational trial and there were some limitations in this trial, but what they did was, uh, they, they looked at all the people um, who at the beginning of the study put down on a survey that they were basically doing a ketogenic diet. Now, not all of them were truly in ketosis. A real good study would look at, uh, at people actually in ketosis. They would actually do blood tests to confirm that there was actually ketone bodies in the blood, um, but they didn't do that. Um, they just looked at uh, a group of 70,000 patients and narrowed it down to 300, about 300 patients whose responses suggested that they were on a very extremely low carb diet. And they compared those to matched people from the study that weren't on such a diet. And they, it was about you know, 1,200 patients uh, that they found that, that matched up to age and, and weight and all these other kinds of things. Um, and the people had pretty comparable weights, actually. Uh, the people on the standard diet actually was a, a, a little bit, a little bit lighter in terms of their uh, of their BMI in terms of their weight. So that was a little bit curious. Um, and the other, I guess, the other detractor in the study is they didn't do follow up surveys like a year later or five years later to see are these people still doing that diet, right? So there are some issues with the with the way the study was done, but. With the data that we that they saw, they they did a survey. They saw who was doing it at the beginning, and then they just tracked these people for twelve years of follow up. And guess what they saw? They saw that uh, nine point eight percent of of people eating the low carb keto paleo Atkins type diet experienced a cardiac event versus four point three percent on a standard diet. Right, and this isn't even comparing to a whole food plant based diet or or a vegan diet or however you want to call it. Right, this is just keto versus standard diet and the risk of a cardiac event was almost double right and so that's um uh obviously a huge increase over uh over what would be expected and why is it well they saw higher levels of both ldl and apolipoprotein b which is just a more accurate measurement of of ldl and through over 50 years of research we just have really indisputable, inarguable evidence that the lower your LDL goes, the lower your risk goes. And the higher your LDL goes, the higher your risk goes. And so it makes sense that a diet that raises your LDL or raises your ApoB is going to increase your risk. And that's what they saw in this observational study. Well, that's what we've seen in lots of other studies as well. And so to transition to that very specific question that got asked, well, my LDL is now 50 was the, was, uh, was, I think what it was, is, is the question. And, you know, I'm on a torvastatin at 20 milligrams. Um, can I stop the medicine? And I would argue 50 is an ideal number. And from another recent study uh, that actually just came out last week, we know that, that medications that get your LDL down to 50 can actually melt away plaque over time. You can actually have regression of atherosclerosis over time, right? We don't see that with LDLs of 100. We don't see that with LDLs of 80 or 90. And we certainly don't see that with LDLs of 140. So certainly I would argue that the lower your LDL is, the better you're off you are. And if you can get there naturally on a plant, whole food plant-based diet, wonderful, great. You don't need anything more. But not everybody can for genetic reasons, for lots of other reasons. And so for those people, I think using all the tools available to you to get down to that range uh, is going to be the best move, right? Because the end, at the end of the day, right, you don't get some special, like, you know, special seat next to God in heaven by making it to heaven on a whole foods plant-based diet alone, right? You get there because you lived a healthy life and you didn't have a heart attack and you didn't have a stroke, right? So there's not some special award for doing, being able to do it the natural way versus doing it with medication. Right. So th there's no special additional benefit. My argument is get to 90 with a healthy brain and a healthy heart with a great quality of life. And however it takes to get there, obviously, preferably with a baseline of a healthy whole food plant based diet. But if it if you have to be on medication because you've had an event, because you've had a stent, because you had bypass surgery, it doesn't mean you're worse. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It just means that you're doing everything you can 
to maximize your chances of living a strong, long, healthy life, right? So that's certainly the advice I give to my patients. It's, it's certainly the advice I would take myself. I use everything possible to reduce my risk, not just one tool. Um, and so uh, with that, I guess I can take some questions. You're muted. Anybody, right there. Uh, oh, there you are. Uh, anybody who's got a question, you're welcome to go to the chat or raise your hand. You just put the uh, gallery view up here so I can see your hand if it pops up. All right, David, you want to unmute? There you go. Okay. Uh, I have a question about uh, statins, though. Uh, a few years ago, I remember there was a big article about uh, the, the, the researchers discovering that uh, everyone on statins, e uh, even uh, people who are asymptomatic to the, the muscle pain problem, um, th they looked at their muscle tissues and all of them um, showed uh, cell cellular damage from the statins. Uh, is that still a concern? So no, I, I, think, I think what you're referring to is that, is that patients on statins will have lower, lower levels of coenzyme Q10. They won't have cellular damage. You don't see cellular damage in, in muscle tissue on statin. And I can show you lots of research that, that proves the exact opposite point that there's no cellular damage. But it is true that everybody on a statin, because of the mechanism of how they work, will have lower, ends, lower levels of coenzyme Q10. And so that's why a lot of people argue that if you're on a statin, you should be on a CoQ10 supplement. Um, that said, um, uh, CoQ10, the other name for it is ubiquinone, right? So that's the name that actually first was created for it because it's found ubiquitously, ubiquitously, everywhere. Every cell has it and it's found in immense amounts. And so uh, modeling studies have shown that even though the, the, the amount in the cell uh, in muscle cells has decreased, uh, it still is more than sufficient for, uh, for cellular processes. And so even though, yes, it will decrease the coenzyme Q10, we still have enough, uh, uh, enough coenzyme Q10 uh, resulting from that. So there's no cellular damage from statins uh, at all. Uh, there was another question in the chat about statins causing Alzheimer's. Again, uh, no evidence of that whatsoever. Um, it, it's again, it's, it's an issue with observational trials, right? Because who, who are the, the most predominant, uh, the largest population of people who take stands are people who have cardiovascular disease, okay? Who are the people at highest risk for dementia? People with cardiovascular disease, right? Because the most common form of dementia is actually not Alzheimer's. The most common form of dementia uh, is, um, is vascular dementia, which has the exact same risk factors as cardiovascular disease. So if you've had a heart attack and you get put on a statin and 20 years later you develop dementia, you could say, oh, it's because of the statin, or you could say, well, that person was already highly at risk for dementia anyway because of their pre-existing cardiovascular disease and risk factors. And so that's, that's the problem with confounding in observational trials. Um, the way you get rid of, the way you take care of that kind of confounding or observational bias or, or population bias um, is by doing randomized control trials. And every single randomized control trial that's ever been done has shown no difference in neurologic outcomes or, or neurologic or, or, uh, or psychomotor performance. And they've done some very, very exquisite studies, even with patients getting down to LDLs in the tens and twenties, and even down as below 10. And there's zero evidence uh, that shows that there's any worsening uh, of, of brain function or increase in dementia uh, at those levels. Uh, there, there's a question says, oh, this was in the previous presentation, there was a study of, uh, that falling asleep well before 10 p.m. is unhealthy. Why is that? I'm not sure if that's uh, exactly what it showed or not. And I don't know, uh, Dr. Liberman, if you've got uh, any information. Yeah, on I, I have to be honest. I, I mean, he ran through that quick. I saw that he was talking about going to sleep at 10 uh, was beneficial because it gives you your seven to eight hours, which is shown to be optimal. I don't know that I've seen anything that purposely going to bed before that or getting longer sleep is actually harmful for you. So I, I guess I'd have to look at that a little bit more carefully, but I, I'm not familiar with anything that says that going to bed at 9.30 uh, would be harmful or nine would be harmful, especially if it's not controlled for, well, when are you waking up, right? Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're going to bed at nine and waking up at, at 
five, again, all the data we have suggests that you've gotten eight hours of sleep and that's probably optimal. So I, I don't know that the time you go to bed is that important other, other than compared to the time you have to wake up. Right. So we'll, I guess we'll have to wait on that one, Kevin, until we get, uh, until we get the, um, the video actually up because I, yeah, yeah. I, I jumped, I saw that too. And I, I think he was basically saying the earlier you go to, to bed and he went all the way to 10 was better and better and better. So I don't, uh, it's hard for me to believe that it would drop off a cliff or go in the other direction. Yeah, I just, I just don't know the mechanism for that either. And then, Mark, um, and then there was one other question in the chat about sands and joint pain. So right. technically it's not joint pain. You shouldn't be getting joint pain, but it would be, it would be muscle pain. So myalgias, because again, stands don't like get into the joints. They don't cause arthritis. They can cause muscle, muscle pain. Uh, and that is true. They can, absolutely. They can about 10% of people report it. Um, it, it, it. I mean, again, we could, we could, we could do a whole talk on stands and, and how they've been complete, completely, uh, uh, you know, demonized, uh, by, you know, by lots of people, by, by lots of, uh, media outlets and whatnot. Um, uh, but I, I guess what I would say is this: is that actually they've they've uh, they've they've done some really really elegant studies where they they, they randomize groups of people to uh, to being on actually they've randomized individuals to be on statin for four weeks and then off for four weeks and then on statin for four and just alternating right and they didn't tell the people when they were on statin and when they weren't and it turns out that they had just as many side effects when they were on placebo as when they were on statin right. And they've done other studies where uh, similar is similar in that range, uh, in, in that in, in that light, where um, it it really actually suggests uh, that it that it, it it's all in our heads, right? That that when they do carefully controlled uh, studies within the same individual or individuals compared to each other, where they'll put one group on placebo and the other group on statin, and then again without the people knowing which one they're on, they switch the two groups of people. There are just as many people, and they've done this as as preliminaries into getting into other kinds of trials. And there's just as many people that, that report awful side effects when they're on stands as when they're off stands and they're just on the placebo dose, right? And there are people. They there was one study that actually took people who were who swore that they were statin intolerant, right? And so to get into the trial, they they wanted to prove it because the study group was looking at the effect of a certain medication as an alternative to statins. And so in this group. Uh, they they put out posters saying, hey, if you're standing intolerant, call, give us a call. And so a lot of people, took, you know, answer the phone call, you know, uh, enrolled in the study. And to prove that they were standing intolerant, they said, OK, uh, we're, we're going to test this out. We're going to see we're going to put you on a stand, but you're not going to know when you go on it. And of all these people that swore that they were standing intolerant, again, just as many people uh, were able to end up being on statin without without them realizing they, they thought they were on placebo and they, were, they had no issues whatsoever. So what came out of this research was this this concept called the nocebo effect. So I don't, I'm sure everybody or many people have heard of the placebo effect, right? What is the placebo effect? The placebo effect is a situation where um, you think you're taking something beneficial, like a supplement or vitamin or something like that. And as a result, you feel, uh, you feel better, right? And, and this is proven. There's a real placebo effect, right? You can put somebody on, on, a, on a green pill and there's, it, it actually matters. Some colors of the pill matter, but you can put somebody on a green pill and you can tell them it's a pain medicine and they will have less pain, right? Placebo effect is a real thing. And that's why when you do clinical trials, you need to do a placebo controlled clinical trial, because if you don't, as soon as somebody takes a pill, there, there's, there, there's a chance of having a positive effect just from taking the pill. So you need to be able to subtract out the placebo effect, right? So the placebo effect is when you take something expecting a benefit and you get a benefit. The nocebo effect, which is a newer concept, is when you take something expecting harm and you get harm, right? You get side effects. And so a lot of the thought in the statin world is people, because of everything that's out there, because of all the people complaining about statins and all the literature and all the, you know, all the podcasts and all the blogs and everything, complaining about how terrible they are and it's just big pharma and all this other stuff. And again, I'm no friend of pharma. I think they're evil, but you can pharma can be evil and they can still have products that are beneficial to you. Um, but um, when you take a medication expecting harm or being afraid of harm, there is a higher likelihood that you are going to have harm. You're going to have side effects. Right. So that said, though, the research observational trials, clinical trials suggest that even if you even if you accept, you know, well, it, whatever people have have symptoms. Right. 
it's still about 10%. So that's getting back to the answer to your question. People, mu muscle aches, muscle pains, myalgias uh, affect probably about 10% of people that take statins. 90% of people can take statins with zero side effects whatsoever, zero. Um, and then if you do have a side effect, uh, we, we usually will typically just switch you to a different medication or different medication. Uh, again, the research suggests that with a little bit of, of thought behind it, 98% of people can get on a statin medication with zero side effects. So there could be a lot of people in that 2%, right? If there's 300 million people in the country, that's a lot of people that could be in that 2% that can't tolerate anything whatsoever. But most people can tolerate it. Now, does that mean that everybody should be on one? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But there are definitely people that would benefit from being on them. Dr. Lerman, do you see the uh, next uh, the question there for Cindy? Um, I can just it's, quickly look in the chat. Sorry. Just, How sorry. do you know when cholesterol levels need to be treated with medication versus hasn't changed for 10 years? Um, you know, yeah. So in this situation, uh, we've given, I've given this talk. Uh, may, maybe it's time to actually think about doing it again. Uh, in this situation, I love to do what's called a calcium score. Right, A calcium score is an easy test. It's $49. It's, uh, there's no... Uh, die. There's no IV. It's just it's just a very low level of radiation. It's on the uh, the order of like two mammograms. Uh, um, so it's not like you're exposing yourself to a, a dangerous amount of radiation or anything like that. It takes uh, 90 seconds to do. Uh, it's not covered by insurance, but it's only forty nine dollars in the Milwaukee metro area at any of the institutions. And you get that. And if it shows that you have no evidence whatsoever of hardening the arteries, you don't need to be on a statin. If, however, your cholesterol is not great and you've been resistant or not really interested in being on a statin, it hasn't changed. Um, and you get a calcium score and it shows that you do have hardening of the arteries. Uh, then I would argue, I would try to twist your arm into getting on a medication, right? Because just because it hasn't changed in 10 years, that doesn't mean it's a good thing, right? Cause you could be building up plaque day by day, month by month, year by year. And even though you don't feel different, it could be right below the surface, uh, you know, uh, and, and maybe the, the cholesterol is just the tip of the iceberg and the majority of the iceberg is below the surface. And that's what's that's what getting you. So so when when people come to me with cholesterol, that's not ideal. And of course, they you know typically don't want to go on medication. Um, I suggest doing a test to see what their true need is. And, and the calcium score is a perfect test for that. Excellent. Thanks. That's a. Uh... It's nice to have something that's forty nine dollars that can give you that uh, much value. Yeah, I was I was actually listening. To, I was actually just listening to a podcast the other day, uh, and they were talking about how in their community it's it's in the hundreds of dollars, like like six hundred dollars. And I just think that's insane. It's such a simple test, and it takes it actually doesn't even take a radiologist. It just it's basically all computer generated. So there's no need for it to be so expensive. And I guess I was just very thankful that I live in a community that's only forty nine bucks. Excellent, Milwaukee's a value. So uh, let me jump here. If does anybody, if anybody else has a question, just uh, raise your hand or put the reaction hand up there. If not, I'm going to jump here and say our next monthly meeting is going to be Thursday, uh, June 8th, 6 p.m. Central Time. Our featured speaker will be plant-based pioneer Dr. Michael Clapper. It's just wonderful to listen to. Uh, if you'd like to receive a notice of this and other upcoming PB Now events and are not currently on our list, just Google us at pbnow or pbnow.org. Once you're on our homepage, just click the white learn more button to register and you'll start to receive notice of our upcoming events. Also re remember, if you'd like to check this uh, video out or this meeting out or the other ones, just go to our video library section in our website or just go right to uh, YouTube, type in pbnow or pbnow.org and you can go back and watch entire talks or just skim through to the parts uh, that, that you want to see uh, that are of particular interest to you. Thanks again to our featured speaker, cardiologist Dr. Andrew Freeman, and our PBNL Medical Director, Dr. Liverman, for sharing uh, valuable time and knowledge with us tonight. And uh, good night, and thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks, everyone.